Hello. Hey, how's it going? Hi, Thomas. How are you? Doing great. Oh, awesome. It's a pleasure to have you here at Crypto Defiance. Uh, so, um, I didn't finish to make your introduction, but um, uh, you won't be able to see the crowd, but the crowd is uh, here. They're really excited to see you. Uh, and uh, and uh, really, really thank, thank you for being here. Uh, so, a lot of people here are not really EOS uh, oriented or EOS aware. So, you'll have to take it uh, from the beginning. <laughs> so, please take it away. I'm sure, I'm sure they're going to... Uh, uh, a lot of questions will, will surge from, from what you have to share. Okay, super. Well, I will share my slides. Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, hopefully that's visible. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we see it. Okay. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, the governance framework and uh, decentralized governance. Uh, the importance of uh, governance to uh, DeFi projects. So a bit about me, um, I'm the Chief Governance Officer at StrongBlock and I chair uh, a group called P2145, it's the IEEE Standards Association's uh, proposed group uh, working on blockchain governance standards. Uh, I used to work at Oracle and then at Pricewaterhouse Coopers and then at IBM. Uh, and I also worked on the government's design for uh, the EOS mainnet prior to its launch when I was an employee at Block One. Uh, I will often tell people that my ambition is to become worthy of the title of Godfather of Blockchain Governance. So uh, that's why I show up at events like this. That's why I chair the IEEE Standards Group. Uh, it's why I've been doing this nonstop for the last two years and, and more. So what I want to address with these slides is if you were creating a new blockchain-based DeFi application, uh, what questions would you ask to better set up your decentralized governance prior to your launch? And I say prior to because if you try to set up governance after you launch, it's much, much, much harder. Uh, but I want to give some acknowledgement to uh, two organizations, uh, the Wharton School. Uh, they invited me to the Wharton Crypto Governance Workshop, where I was one of 25 participants. We did a lot of very interesting and useful work there. And the IEEE Standards Association, uh, they've both been very supportive of, uh, of my work. So the very first thing I, I, I have to explain to folks, because people rarely rarely understand this uh, correctly, is what is governance actually? Uh, and you have to understand that the, the word governance is a reference to a system of managing a collective, and the word collective is crucial, a collective by providing for three things. Number one, for decision making, um, especially decisions that were uh, not anticipated uh, before they came up. Secondly, decision execution. It's not enough to decide to do something. You have to then uh, carry out the decision. Uh, and third is uh, amending the decision-making rules and the execution processes. So if we've been deciding with a majority vote and we want to make that a two-thirds vote, uh, or amending the decision-making rule, uh, so you'll see that this is, the system of governance actually is used to amend itself. What's the governing collective? I said collective is an important word. Uh, a collective, which includes a multi-node, multi-user blockchain, is any group where the following things are true. Number one, the users wish to make decisions, yet uh, the cost for them getting to unanimity is high. If unanimity were easy, you wouldn't need governance. You just all agree 100% to do something. So we have to assume the cost of unanimity is high, and also the cost of not deciding is high. Because if the cost of unanimity is high, but you don't mind if you just, we just, well, you just won't decide, uh, uh, then, you, then you don't really need governance. But if 
all of these things are true. You do wish to make decisions. It's hard to get to unanimous consent or unanimous agreement. And just not deciding uh, is expensive and difficult. Then you're, you have, you're in a situation where governance is appropriate. Uh, and so typically you'll find that the members will agree up front, uh, often at the time they join, to allow for at least some uh, less than unanimous decisions to nevertheless be binding uh, uniformly on everyone. Not just binding on the ones who said yes, but binding on everyone. Uh, so governance has within it the capacity for uh, oppression, for minority voters, for those who uh, lose the vote and are nevertheless affected by the decision. Uh, every consortium is a collective, and every blockchain system is a collective. Now that's true because members of a blockchain system do need to make decisions on whether it's consensus or upgrades or whatever. And the members of that system behave that those choices are binding. I say they behave rather than that they agree, because they may never agree in a formal sense. I mean, the, the people who use Bitcoin don't all sign some agreement up front that the choices are binding. They behave that the choices are binding by showing up and using the system. And if you don't agree with the choices, then you fork, whether it's the theory of classic Bitcoin cash work. Uh, a bit more about uh, blockchain system. I would say that every blockchain system is governed to some extent. If we assume that deciding to do nothing is a decision, and also that a de facto decision counts as a decision, then that would mean that a blockchain system can have no formal governance mechanisms but still be governed. And a blockchain system, system that makes no changes could still be considered governed. Uh, therefore, all blockchain systems have governance except possibly a system with no nodes, because there's really nothing there. Uh, not every DeFi system is well governed. You have to ask yourself, what are the key financial and operational decisions that a DeFi system must make? Uh, and realistically, it can only code for a narrow band uh, of, of things, uh, a fairly short list of stuff. It's predictable that unpredictable decisions will come at you. Uh, a bug fix or an upgrade, a, a regulatory change, if regulatory compliance is important to your system, uh, a new product, a new feature of an existing product, uh, a change of governance. Any one of these could force you to uh, take on a, a collective decision to do something new or different. And wow, I've got to make a collective decision, that's governance. Uh, you could say that the Dow was, in retrospect, badly governed. Uh, at the height of the hack, it only got 5% voter participation. Uh, Maker Dow can be considered a very good, positive example of DeFi governance. I want to mention the importance of legitimacy, uh, concept of legitimacy and effectiveness. Uh, these are two different aspects of governance. They are mutually reinforcing or mutually undermining. Uh, research on people's engagement with governance systems uh, shows that people do not experience governance as legitimate if they, the users, aren't familiar with it, even if it's simple, even if it's fair, and even if it's long established. If people aren't personally familiar with the way the system works because they haven't used it for whatever reason, uh, they often view it as an illegitimate activity. Uh, users also will come to despise institutions that are weak or ineffective, which saps as institutions of their perceived legitimacy. And then the other direction, if you have a lack of perceived legitimacy, that causes users to resist or undermine the institution, rendering them ineffective. So my point here is that because I'm repeating the same point from the prior slide, if you aren't familiar with your system, even if it's fair and simple and established, they won't experience it as legitimate, yet you need legitimacy. So the guidance here is to force users to use the governance tools, find excuses for them to engage with it so that they get to know it, so they are familiar. Make sure familiarity is a goal, a design goal of the interaction with the system. 
You know, these are just, we'll despise institutions that are weak, so don't make weak institutions. Uh, test nets are your friend when it comes to trying these things out. And we know that a lack of perceived legitimacy will cause users to resist run by the institution. So the guidance there is to safeguard legitimacy and reputation at all costs. Uh, if you have a group member who is consistently seeking to undermine the legitimacy of whatever your governance system is, you need to persuade them or make appropriate changes so their criticisms uh, are no longer relevant or find a way to silence them or force them out because they are undermining your system. And the undermined system will fail. Uh, a bit on governance uh, agents and the idea of corruption. Uh, the big risk with agents is corruption. I'll explain what, what corruption is here in the next few bullets. Uh, and agents are an important part of governance because unless you have uh, all of your votes and all of your activities being carried out by 100% of users, you're going to have to rely on a subset of users that the large bulk of users trust in some way. Agents, in other words. Uh, agents are almost always used, whether it's clear or not, they're, they're almost always used in most sophisticated governance systems, which always opens the door to risk of corruption. <coughs> Second person uses that entrusted power for their own gain and not for the purpose it was entrusted to them for, that's corruption. You okay? Yeah, we, we lost connection? for a bit, but, uh, but, but I think we're good now. Yeah. I'll turn off my video just to preserve our bandwidth. Ah, probably. Uh, trans I'll close my too. Yeah, yeah that, that'll probably help at least a little bit. Yeah, I'll close my too. Yeah. Uh, so we're talking about uh, agents and corruption. The definition of corruption as being the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. And the word transparency means in that context shedding light on shady deals, on weak enforcement of rules, and other illicit practices that are by good governance for government or ethical business or society at large. And uh, corruption corrodes the fabric of society. These top, these three bullets here right above defining corruption. Uh, come from Transparency International, which is a group that works globally to fight uh, corrupt business and governance practices. Uh, and uh, I think this is absolutely true, and corruption will corrode the fabric of your blockchain system, your DeFi system. And uh, while well, blockchains and DAOs and smart contracts do have some limited ability to reduce corruption and increase transparency, simply having a blockchain does not guarantee uh, that you're out of the woods. You've got to be thinking about this in your design. So a bit known more on government's effectiveness. Your institutions and your automation need to work as promised. They need to address legitimate needs and they need to address them in legitimate ways. And they need to not cause extra problems. And lastly, they need to be amendable. Only when all four of these are true will people feel comfortable with your institution in your system of automation. Uh, another way of saying that is that we were, all modern governance structures and agents require a belief by the governed that the structure or the agent is acting appropriately, is staying within norms, and is addressing the key needs of the system. Now you might start to notice that um, I've got decentralized users around the globe who may not all share a culture and they have all sorts of different backgrounds. What do you mean staying within norms? What are the norms? Well, It'll be on you as the designer of the system to set the norms and educate and onboard the users to what the norms are so they understand that what we're doing is correct or that it's not and they need to help you take action. The typical sources of legitimacy when it comes to governance systems of any kind are three. Tradition, charisma, and the rational legal tradition. Traditional like kings and queens or the pope, or that's how we've always done it, or Satoshi now that it's been 10 years. Uh, charismatic, I, I use the example of Napoleon or Vitalik, 
And if you don't laugh when I say that Vital is charismatic, then you're not paying attention. <laughs> and thank you. And uh, rational legal, which has to do with this idea of consent of the governed and following the Greek processes. And the rational legal tradition is very, very powerful now and has been for the last two, three hundred years. Uh, a quick note on uh, algorithms and using algorithms in governance. Uh, Matthew Crawford raised uh, a very interesting criticism in a recent article called Algorithmic Governance and Political Legitimacy. I, he agrees that, yes, agents do tend to abuse power. And so, yes, principles do bind agents to uh, a set of rules in order to reduce their abuses of power. Uh, and the binding of agents to rules by principles is often called liberal proceduralism. And that concept dates back to the English Revolution of, I want to say, 1866, if not earlier. Uh, and algorithmic judgments can resemble liberal proceduralism. Because, oh, look, there's rules. Oh, look, my agent is a piece of software and it follows rules. There's a problem. Algorithmic governance tends to place authority beyond scrutiny. Uh, I can't see inside the code. Uh, the judgments may be inexplicable, even by the programmers, even by the code itself. If you're using machine learning, if you're using artificial intelligence, one of the hallmarks of a lot of the deep learning systems is they can sit. The systems themselves cannot introspect and tell you why they made the decision they made. The ability, uh, to, the ability of an agent to explain what, what, what they did and why they did it is a uh, fundamental underpinning uh, of legitimacy. So I've changed background colors to draw attention to this slide. Uh, this is not a definition, this is a recommendation. Uh, a governance design process. If you have a new blockchain system, a new DeFi system, you might want to follow steps similar to this. Uh, identify, of course, your founding stakeholders, you know, that you got the right people at the table to do the initial setup and design. Be clear on the purpose of the new system. Define the scope for governance, which things are operational processes that are done on a routine basis and for which we write detailed code in advance and detailed processes in advance versus governance, which is, by its nature, going to handle ad hoc things. Uh, define your target stakeholders and their interests. Who, are we, who am I attracting to the chain? Whose interests are at stake here? What are those interests? Uh, and then we need to define governance powers, governance processes, and governance institutions. And I will do my best to show you what I mean by those three words power, process, and institution. And you need to set up the governance mechanisms in the code. Now, there's a lot implied by these, this short list. Uh, let me talk about stakeholders and interests. So what classes of stakeholders are we anticipating? Uh, additional classes might arise. Do I have you know, decentralized application developers? Or do I have app admins separate from developers? What about users? Are there token holders? Do I have a special DAP token, for instance? Are there, say, block producers or super nodes or, or validated nodes who uh, do something that's relevant to my DAP? Then for each of those stakeholder classes, what interest do they share, what interest do they not share? You know, for example, Bitcoin transaction fees, users want them down and miners want them up. Two constituencies with divergent interests. So make a list of all the important interests, whether it's block size or interest rate or block reward or any number of other things. And then focus on, particularly on the areas where the interests are not aligned. Because if interests are well aligned, it, you could probably get to uh, good enough agreement you know, fairly easily in an emergency. For interests are not aligned, uh, you're going to want to allocate power among your stakeholders to prevent harmful concentrations of power. And this sets up a process called mechanism design, which is a, a technical term. It's a field of economics and game theory for, uh, as Wikipedia puts it, taking an engineering approach to designing economic mechanisms and incentives. You got to create mechanisms that align interests. You may want to require supermajorities. You may want to create interdependencies where group A requires group B to, uh, you know, make a proposal, or group A can do something but group B has to not object. Uh, the executive branch, the president of the United States, appoints his own cabinet members, but they can only serve temporarily until the Senate a different body from the legislative branch uh, provides uh, advice and consent 
they have to ratify that person or that person cannot serve on the cabinet for more than a, a brief period. It's an interdependency. And I offer this very uh, cynical definition of an alliance uh, in the context of interdependency creation. Uh, in international politics, the union of two thieves who have their hands so deeply inserted in each other's pockets that they cannot separately plunder a third, as Ambrose Bierce likes to say. Uh, you want to make people dependent on one another so they have to work together. Uh, you've got an inclusion and exclusion. You want to make, answer the question in advance, how are my different classes of stakeholders included in or excluded from different aspects of the system's operations, how do individuals join uh, the network, join a class, leave a class, leave the entire network voluntarily, how do they get ejected from a class or get ejected from the entire network. If you cannot force somebody out of your system, you don't really have a system. Or at least you don't have proper uh, sophisticated governance. And there, there are very few exceptions to this, but they're very rare. Uh, you've got to have some sort of a boundary whereby a bad actor can be blacklisted, ex excluded, removed somehow. I, I believe that to be true. Uh, I'm open to be dissuaded. I mentioned that I would define powers, processes, and institutions. And I'm going to near the end of my time, so I'll be quick. What uh, are the powers that must be exercised for my system to operate? Is it you know, we have to make blocks. We have to get consensus on the finality of blocks. That's a, a power. Because it's routine and every day, it's not really a governance process or governance power. It's more of an operational process. Uh, what about selection of producers? That might start to shift a little bit of governance there. What else? You're going to need a catch-all because you can't anticipate everything that may come up. For each power, ask what process will exercise the power. How will we go about that? And then what institution will I create to carry out the process to exercise the power? Let's look at an example. Um, so policy making, you want to set some sort of policy. Maybe you have a system with members, and people buy in and become members. And you let the members set policy. Uh, and then you may also want to have a system of custodians, say, carry out policy. Maybe the members select the custodians. Uh, through some process you've got. You're also, number three, going to need policy interpretation for specifications, sometimes referred to as judicial, uh, whether it's simply a, a reference to an external arbitrator or uh, some sort of internal system. Every successful system has a method for interpreting policy for the specific case, some sort of judicial type of function. Uh, various options exist for that. And there may be formally or informally a system for either inquiry or investigation. It could be called journalism, it could be called compliance. It's some way to prove the facts of the matter uh, in a given case. Let me back up. Uh, it helps you with transparency, it helps you maintain legitimacy, it helps you uh, prove that what you're doing is correct so that your users don't lose faith in you. So here's an example of setting, setting policy. Let's say someone loses their account key, uh, and you've got some mechanism in your DeFi system to replace the lost key, supposedly. Let's pretend that's true. Uh, you or the members might set a policy that with a 51% vote of members, uh, and upon receipt of proof of actual loss, and upon receipt of proof of verification that the requester is the person who owns the account, uh, if 51% of members agree then a lost key could be replaced with a new key. Uh, that would be a policy. But then you need to carry that policy out. You might all furthermore say that custodians will have, will change a key within 24 hours of receiving on-chain notice of a 51% vote. And then interpretation, let's say a particular member challenges a particular key change request as being an invalid change. What about inquiry and investigation that is going to refer to, say, zero-knowledge proofs that are provided to regulators or proofs provided in the policy interpretation case where the member is challenging the key change uh, or proofs for uh, demonstrating that I really did lose my key and I really am me. Journalism compliance also will cover the, uh, the function available to the arbitrator or the, the judicial function when it needs to 
collect information to render a judgment, uh, hopefully in a way that doesn't then expose things previously hidden. Otherwise, people will weaponize the uh, uh, dispute resolution system to surface hidden data. So the key replacement, uh, so the lost keys can be replaced. Then Jamal loses his key. Uh, maybe he tells his boss on the east because you've got business members uh, on the east that files the request using a screen and a replace key request smart contract, which records the reasons why people should vote yes. So we've already got a system and a process, and we've got some code somewhere and some screen somewhere. And then the members are prompted to cast their vote because they're off living their lives and doing their work. And then we go tap on the shoulder and say, hey, someone needs your attention. We also need a system to collect votes and tally votes. Uh, all right, we voted, we made a decision. Wait, still got to carry it out. So custodians shall use their power. So the successful member of vote needs to create some sort of candidate transaction, some piece of code that's been approved by policymakers that is presented to custodians to execute. And the custodians cryptographically sign that transaction with their keys to actually carry out the transaction. Uh, so you see again, division of power. Mention institutions. Uh, so if we say the lost keys will be replaced by 51% of members, well, members have to be registered to vote in some sort of assembly that has this key replacement authority. And the assembly is defined in the governing documents that people sign when they join. Uh, and we also need the assembly to uh, define the, that they have the ability to give orders to custodians to do certain things. Thomas, uh, we'll, we'll need to wrap up in one minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you get the idea. There's a lot of, of work here uh, under the covers. Uh, I'll jump over incentive mechanisms. Uh, what processes need institutions? You need a scope statement. You need a stakeholder definition. You need the adjudication process a way to develop a proposal for change, including the code for the change, a way to freeze the proposal, GitHub or whatever, uh, publicize, discuss, decide, execute. That's the life cycle of the government's decision. And I'll point out that on-chain things like voting, tallying votes and collecting signatures have to be matched with off-chain activities like debating, campaigning, making up your own mind and setting norms. And that's just for deciding what about Implementing, you have to register and register voters and auto executed code, and then non automatable things are hard to automate things, uh, and then the unautomatable enforcing of norms. What about amendments? We have to have code change and negotiating and writing. So, on chain and off chain governance must both exist and they help each other. This is a, a commercial slide from my employer, Strongblock. We have a lot of on chain uh, pieces to support governance. Uh, next steps. IEEE is doing work on this. Uh, if you want to get involved, please join us. And uh, we've had our first meeting. Questions? Thanks. Not, first of all, thanks yeah. a lot, Thomas. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I want a uh, quick question because we're running out of time. Um, you mentioned that um, transparency and shedding a light on corruption might help um, to eliminate corruption, right? So on, a, on, a, on our small world, NEOS, uh, I, I, I know that uh, Colin, uh, Colin Talks Crypto and myself from NEOS Israel, uh, we're shedding a light on some block producers that are wanting to corruptly buy some proxies for voting, and we actually kind of expose them on Twitter and calling on this video. And on a much larger scale, we see that Donald Trump made this call with the Ukrainian president and, uh, and offered him uh, the military help only if he would help him uh, dig dirt on his opponent. So that's blatant corruption, right? And there is uh, transparency and, and there's a shedding of light on that corruption process. So the, the real question here is, do you really think that the, the mere process of shedding a light on it and exposing it uh, helps helps uh, uh, fight it or or at least uh, get, uh, at least uh, yeah at least uh, create less corruption yeah, yeah it, it's an important uh, step it's a mandatory step but it's not sufficient by itself if you shed light on a corrupt practice but you have a, a community that doesn't really care uh, or that isn't bothered by that or isn't willing to take action 
then the shedding of lights is sufficient. It, all it does is it helps people see just how corrupt their systems are. Uh, but if people have to get mad and take action, or, or, or get mad and leave, or, or something, uh, if without the, the action of the, of the society as a whole, the collective, if you will, uh, without the majority seeking to prevent the minority from self-dealing and, uh, and harming the system, it, it, it'll fail. Uh, so yeah, you can, you can point out the, the corrupt practices, but if nobody then votes out the, the bad VPs, or if no one puts in a proposal to, uh, as I've suggested, to zero out the token balances of wallets that engage in vote buying uh, and vote selling, then uh, there's no skin in the game, there's no sanction, there's no reason to stop. So uh, you've got to have sanctions, and sanctions have to have teeth, and those have to be uh, insisted on by the majority. So, uh, I, so I want to thank you again, Thomas, really, for taking the time, being with us here live. Uh, Absolutely. We truly appreciate your knowledge, and for the whole Crypto Defiance, uh, I, <laughs> thank you again. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you very much. I'll see you soon.